There's this story in physics about how one of Richard Feynman's students once asked him, is there an intuitive way of understanding the intermediate axis theory? As the story goes, Feynman paused for a moment, thought about it, and said, no. Let's see if we can't fix that. There's a simple way to observe this theorem. Take a typical tennis racket. It has three axes. The first runs through the handle, the second is parallel to the head, and the third is perpendicular to the head. Now, consider spinning the racket along these axes. You'd imagine a simple rotation in all cases, or in other words, as the racket spins around the chosen axis, the other axes stay stable. In reality, though, this is only true for the first and third axes. By placing red and green tape on other sides of the racket, we can verify that, in both cases, there's only a rotation on the chosen axis. We can also see that the racket spins slower on its third axis, and this is due to its moment of inertia. Essentially, the moment of inertia is how much angular acceleration an object can receive when given a certain torque, or in other words, how fast it can spin given how hard you spin it. The mass of the racket is distributed closer to the first axis than any other, and so it spins the fastest, and we say it has the smallest moment of inertia. On the other hand, the racket's mass is distributed the furthest away from the third axis, and thus it spins the slowest and has the highest moment of inertia. When looking at the moment of inertia for the second axis, we see that it's a mix of both, and although distinct, if we spin the racket along it, the result is unexpected. There isn't only a rotation along the second axis, or intermediate axis, but along all three. This is the intermediate axis theorem. Objects with three axes, each possessing distinct moments of inertia, will have stable rotations along the first and third axis, but unstable rotations along the second. This effect can be seen much more clearly in a low-gravity environment. Videos like this from the International Space Station show the intermediate axis theorem taking place. Since there's no gravity making the object fall, we can see just how unbelievable the effect really is. Okay, so we've understood the physical concepts, but what about the math? A good place to start are Euler's equations. Developed by the great Leonard Euler, they describe the rotation of a rigid body and, in this iteration, under torque-free conditions. The i's represent the moments of inertia with regards to each axis, and the omegas represent the angular velocities, meaning how fast our object is spinning. Before understanding how these equations work with the second axis, let's look at the first, bring back our racket, and consider it spinning along the first axis. Since the racket was spun on its first axis, this means that the angular velocities for the other two axes would be quite small by comparison. Taking this into account in our equation, this means that we can consider omega 2 and omega 3 as essentially zero. This in turn makes the whole left hand side null, and since the moments of inertia are constant, we can conclude that the time derivative of omega is null. This implies that the angular velocity along the first axis is constant, and we can use this fact in the other two equations. So going back to our two other equations, with omega 1 being constant, we can see that there is only one variable on each side of the equation. So let's isolate the time derivatives of omega 2 and omega 3, and replace all the constants by a lowercase k. Now let's take a look at the second derivatives with respect to time. They're proportional to their respective omegas, and what's more we can verify that k2, k3 is always smaller than zero. We can solve this equation for omega, and the solution shows that it oscillates. This means that omega 2 and omega 3 will perpetually oscillate around their original values, remaining small and never disturbing the rotation along the first axis. By the same method, we can see that this reasoning applies to the third axis and explains why both rotations are stable. Now, let's look at what happens when the racket spins on the second axis. Initially, we can assume parameters similar to our last example, so the angular velocities on the first and third axis are negligible. Following this, we can determine that omega 2 is constant, and we arrive at an expression for the time derivative of omega. Here, the uppercase k simply groups all the constants together. If we derive this with respect to time again, we see that k1, k3 is always greater than zero, and this is where the imbalance lies. When we solve for omega, we see that the resulting equation is exponential. This means that the angular velocities on both the first and third axis will grow exponentially until they're large enough to cause rotations. That is the cause of the intermediate axis theorem. From our initial equations describing rigid bodies in motion, we can see that any object with three axes and a distinct moment of inertia for each axis will experience the intermediate axis theorem.
Now that we have an understanding of the concepts and the math, let's verify everything with some simulations. Using some pre-written Python code, we can produce the same object we saw in the ISS video and look at how the angular velocities change on each axis. So what we're looking at here is a simulation of a t-bar in zero gravity, similar to the one we saw in the ISS video earlier. We can also see the axes quite clearly. Now, what this code allows us to do is actually look at the values of the angular velocities as a function of time. So as we spin the t-bar on its intermediate axis, we see what we saw with Euler's equations. Their values increase until they're high enough to affect the t-bar, and after it shifts, everything resets and the process starts all over again. As we look at the t-bar spinning on its other two axes, we see that the angular velocities also vary periodically, but they always oscillate around their original values, and so they don't affect the t-bar in a significant way at all. This quick simulation really ties a bow on everything and lets us see both the math and the physics at the same time. So coming back to our original question, it seems like Feynman had a point. No surprise there. The intermediate axis theorem may not be the most intuitive idea in physics, but as we get a grasp of the physical concepts and the mathematics behind it, we can start to map it out and understand a law of nature that seems to be more magic than physics. Ooh.